Greetings in the name of the Most High. Coming to you from the uh, West Coast, over the Pacific, and um, I've understood that some of you think, well, the podcasts have dwindled, are not as frequent, and so forth. And I'm here to tell you that um, that's a bad bet. When people think there's a trend with me, they are always um, wrong (laughs) and proven wrong. And that has just been, you know, the way it is. There is no trend. Just like, you know, I wasn't here on the West Coast um, last week. I was in New Mexico. You know, now I am... um, at uh, San Onofre um, figuring out that uh, basically you know a few things a nice you know it's a nice place but I really don't have any love for the uh, the water the way that I used to it's um, you know I don't mind uh, swimming in it and all that I used to be a pretty avid surfer and to do that you've got to really you know be here on a daily basis or you or you lose it it's not a weekend uh, situation. It's not. It's not something you do like skiing, you know, th- three weeks a month out of the winter time, and that's it. And that's if you're pretty active. It's not like that at all. If you sit it out for two weeks or a month, you lose it. And um, getting back into it means work. So I'm just not really that interested in that. I'm. I see all these uh, kids here who are all competing to be the coolest, you know, cat in the water. And it comes down to that old adage, the person having the most fun. I mean, whether you do it in an inner tube, on a surfboard, and you you body surf, you uh, get your feet in the water, however you do it, if if that's what causes you to praise the creator. I'm I'm in the middle of driving. I'm uh, in a campground. I can't run my generator to, to make coffee except for the press that I've got, you know, and uh, I'm, I'll drive, I'm actually driving for a coffee, and I need to do this audio. Yesterday I spent um, quite a bit of time in the book of Ezekiel, in chapter 8, 9, 10, 11. You really have to read these in context, uh, well, 8, 9, and 10 specifically, you got to read these in context to understand the connection. And we're going to have to do this right now. I'm Where do I begin? I'll begin here. Some of you are being gang stalked. Uh, some of you are being, you know, manipulated in a way that you never have been. The, um, the whole idea of these now flash mobs, which is really gang stalking going mainstream, which is what we predicted it would do. Gang stalking would become a mainstream idea. Count on it. Do not do not doubt me on this. It 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 will be uh, as mainstream as mom and apple pie soon enough. Just as flash mobs are in the. It was never so clear as when I was studying and actually teaching, you know, live the word of Ezekiel. It was never, the the whole, every podcast I've done, everything I've done for the last decade became crystal clear in those three chapters, eight, nine, and ten. And basically what it says is this, and I'll just give you this driving version uh, of it. You know, number one, the Lord's, oh, there's the Starbucks, okay, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, I hate giving money to that witch, don't you? But that's the only thing that's going to be open around, you know, 5 a.m. here. So I got a story. Ezekiel 8. Basically is the chapter about, you know, they call that the idolatry chapter, but it's really about perversion done behind closed doors. Yes, they worship the sun. Yes, they, and I need to go through this line by line, and we, we really should do that to get to this clarity I'm talking about. There's a crystal clear message that comes forth. Um, 
but God shows Ezekiel all the abominations that the 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 well the wealthy do. He shows them um, everything that the elites are doing in secret. He shows them everything done, dirty little thing done behind closed doors. He he shows them. He he um, exposes them. He shows Ezekiel. He prophesies uh, over to Ezekiel to, to give prophecy. Ezekiel prophesies over Israel that God will not let this stand. So all the pedophilia, <clears throat> you know, ritual, satanic ritual. In other words, the, 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 I got the impression from it that basically um, anything goes. I mean, we're talking about sex with beasts. We're talking about um, worshiping um, idols on the wall. We're talking about you know, whatever kind of way those things are worshipped, whatever kind of perversions, the Lord call it, calls it perverseness. You know, there's it shows Ezekiel the perverseness. <clears throat> it's not just the abominations of idol worship, which is the surface interpretation, which I've heard teachers teach. No, he's talking about basically the deal, you know, the elite deal of what they have uh, going on. You know, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the situation the elites find themselves in and i suppose it's the same for you know jerusalem as it would be for washington dc i mean here we have the ultimate ultimate people and they are completely blowing it um and here's what they think in the secret societies and that's what we're dealing with ezekiel is basically shown the secretist society he was led into the secret rituals of the secret society, which is perverseness, according to God's word. Okay. Just exactly what we have today. So he's brought in and the Lord exposes it. And the main thing is these people believe that God does not um, see them. <clears throat> they believe that they do these rituals in complete secret. And we've talked about this. They don't think that God is actually able to do anything. They say, God has gone away. He's abandoned us here. So we're free to do what we want, which is basically do these rituals in order so that we, so that we can uh, overcome this life, so we can stay in power, so we can be wealthy, so we can be the elite. In other words, we have to do these rituals. God's left leaving. A, they're not just worshiping idols because it feels good. They're worshiping idols and involved in perverseness with one another and with also that there's an allusion to animals. So not just animal sacrifices, but I, I say that the, some of the perverseness is animal sex, uh, you know, putting on animal parts and dressing up as animals and all kinds of weird things like that. I mean, that's what I'm seeing here. Um, now, Chapter nine, chapter nine goes into, you know, uh, basically uh, slaying the entire city. So the response on chapter eight, you say, God sees and God will repay and God will cleanse the house of Israel. Chapter nine, gird up, get ready. I'm ready to kill. I'm ready to kill everybody that was involved in this. So it follows right on. It follows on. It d doesn't go somewhere else. Chapter 9 could be also chapter 8. So the first thing he says is, He cried in mine ears with, with a loud voice saying, Cause them to have charge over the city to draw near, every, uh, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. Okay, he's getting ready to destroy the people. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand, and one man among them was clothed in linen. That's, uh, that's, I always consider that to be an angel. So, you know, whether it's in Daniel or here, the man in linen <clears throat> is an angel because it's all about angels. By the time I get done here, it reveals the angelic realm. And, oh, you'd think we're just going to dwell on perverseness. No, we're going to, it, it flows into the angelic. It is just unbelievable. How could anyone miss this? But you have to have eyes. You know, the Lord, you know, opened my eyes to something yesterday. And um, I had to tell, <clears throat> I have to tell people, 
get ready for interaction with angels, but don't think it's going to be like you think. Oh, you thought that we're just going to talk about secret societies and perversion and satanic ritual abuse? Are you kidding? That's nothing. Haven't we discussed that over the last decade or so? Mind control, gang stalking, satanic ritual abuse of children, raising them up, up to be elites through traumatizing them and abusing them sexually, which they call opening, you know, the, the they think it's opening the power centers up. They think it's like, you know, opening the chakras or something. Anyway, so in chapter nine, here's what happens. The man in linen is given this huge ink horn. Okay, it's like a, like a ram's horn filled with ink, but it's huge. <clears throat> And, um, okay. And, um, and that's by his side. And he said, look, God said, go to everyone that is righteous and all the people crying out against these abominations and mark them with the ink, you know, not marked for death, but marked for mercy because these people have been praying, you know, they know what's going on and they're praying about it. You know, people are actually lining up and parking outside Starbucks and waiting for it to open. It is actually, it is open. Um, that's just amazing to me, but it's good to know at this hour you can get, uh, an espresso. So, so, you, you know, um, they're being marked, but here's what happens. And the glory of God of Israel had gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city. This is the glory of the Lord. This is a glory cloud, which came up from the cherub, from the angel. So here, this is being um, basically overseen. In other words, God showed Ezekiel. Ezekiel was shown. God told Ezekiel what he was going to do. And in chapter nine, he starts doing it. We see the cherub, the angel. We see the man in linen. We see the glory cloud coming out of the cherub and then talking to the man in linen, giving a command. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city and through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh. And that means, you know, they cry out in, 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 in anger about all this and are upset. And cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. They cry because they hate those abominations because, you know, people know, you know, what the, you know, what, what the head of the thing is doing. You know, people tend to be conformed and, you know, they know what the elites do and they cover for them. These don't cover for them. And to the others, he said in, in mine hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite. In other words, those not marked with the ink, kill them all, kill them all. Men, women, children, kill them all. In other words, sons and daughters of, uh, um, you know, the abominators. Slay the utterly old and the young, and both the maids and little children and women. But do not come near any man who has the mark. And begin, where? At my sanctuary. Begin at the house of the Lord. Kill all the priests. Because they're the ones doing the rituals, the satanic rituals. Okay? So it came to pass while they were slaying them and I was left. I fell upon my face and I cried. Ah, my lights just went out. So now I had to find a way to get more light here. Okay. So it came to pass while we were, sl while, while they were slaying them. So while these people are getting butchered with um, some sort of uh, weapon of, of, of mass death. Ah, Lord God, will thou destroy all the residue of Israel? in thy pouring out of the fury upon Jerusalem. And then he said unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding and great, and the land is full of blood, and the city is full of perverseness. Blood. In other words, a lot of murders, a lot of ritual sacrifice to Satan going on in the secret Ezekiel 8 behind closed doors in honor of the idols, which are not idols, but represent spirits in the spirit realm of spirits that they contact for their power to do more abominations. The Lord has forsaken, and they said, the Lord has forsaken the earth and the Lord does not see. Okay, so the Lord is complaint is that that the elites don't believe that they're being seen or they'll be caught. And as for me also, 
Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. In other words, their way. They have a way, a structured way. And upon their head, it will be repaid. In other words, their way is basically the satanic way is you get in our way, you wind up on our altar as the next sacrifice. So they were going to go ahead and... Uh, um, and, 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 and that God was going to re recompense equal for equal. And behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. He marked those for mercy to be witnesses of God's fury, which is how the Bible refers to it, fury. But it's not just about cleaning the temple, meaning killing all the, you know, perverted assholes i mean you know basically lining them up and shooting them all it's not that's that's not the point that judgment has been done oh good we can all go home now uh and how much of the city was destroyed the way i look at it about 80 percent of the population there was was slain i don't look at like you know a tremendous amount of people ha that have the inkhorn i'd say about 80 percent are slain Eighty percent slain. It looks to me like the Inkhorn people, the people who will be spared, is a small enough number that um, the, the the guy had a writer's Inkhorn at his side. You know, I mean, you know, big. You know, like I imagine a ram's horn with with you know some sort of lid on it that you know has ink in it. You know, and uh, basically that um, that one ram horn would be enough to. Um, pretty much mark everybody and you could mark a lot of people with that but certainly you're not going to mark millions of people i mean you know the whole idea here is there are in my opinion and there's no way to prove this but this is what i get from it that there are very few that are marked with the inkhorn and the, the, these are the people who sigh and who cry out and pray to the lord to stop the abominations, like I pray every day to the Lord, to stop the abominations, to stop the witchcraft, to stop the people from harming our people. You know, we have a lot of people who are in real trouble right now and are just hanging by a thread. But I know if we pray and ask our Father for bread, He will not give us a stone. Amen? Okay. So, chapter 10 is a follow-on of chapter 9. You can't read chapter 8 Without chapter 9, you can't read chapter 9 without chapter 10 or you miss out on, on what the point of chapter 8 is. The punta, the point, the whole raison d'etre, all that contained in chapter 10. And this is going to shock you because this is not what you're going to think. Then I looked and behold, this is chapter 10. In the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them as it were a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. And he spake unto uh, the man clothed in linen. Here, we, here he is again in chapter 10. And said, go in between the wheels, even under the cherub, and fill thine hand with the coals of fire from between the cherubims, and scatter them over the city. And he went uh, in my sight, the man in linen, to basically deal with the massive ufo what we call a ufo but i mean it's the the cherub the cherub operates the ufo the angel at, at the same time the cherubim is these are these spinning wheels in the air okay and then something that he said like a throne of god but the power source is like uh some kind of a a bright light some kind of an energy source they want scattered about the city this supernatural force, this other dimensional force. Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house when the man went in and this cloud filled the inner court. People call it the glory cloud of God, which is basically God is a spirit, right? And he's appearing in a supernatural form as this cloud that is accompanied by these wheels and by these creatures and by these super, this whole just... You know, you can hear the music, right? And the awe of people, if they saw this, they would just be on their knees. This is lighting up all of Jerusalem in the midst of the bloodbath. We have the whole UFO thing happening. Okay? So the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house. 
and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full in the brightness of the Lord's glory. So this is not just a cloud. It, the cloud has light. And the sound of the cherubim's wings was heard even to the outer court, and the voice of the Almighty God when he spoke. And it came to pass that when he had commanded the man clothed in linen, saying, Take fire from between the wheels, from between the cherubims. And he went in and stood beside the wheels. Big wheels. <laughs> Big wings. Okay. So the cherubim, cherubims are going to come into view here. And one cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubims unto the fire that was between the cherubims and took thereof. See, the cherubims are all part of this structure of this massive object, which also is accompanied by the cloud of glory of the Lord and the throne of God is in the form of this experience involving creatures, cherub, cherubims, which are all part of a ship, of a massive ship, and took thereof. And anyway, so the cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubims under the fire that was between the cherubims, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the great light between the cherubims, and took thereof and put it in his hands of him that was clothed with linen, and took it and went out. And this was to be spread around the city. And there appeared in the cherubims, in the cherubims, there appeared uh, the form of a man's hand under their wings. And when I looked, behold, four wheels by the cherubims, one wheel by one cherub, and another wheel by another cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was as the color of barrel stone. And as for their appearances, they had, four, one, they had one likeness, as if a wheel had been in the midst of, the, of a wheel. So we have inner, inner spinning wheels, both spinning different directions. And when they went, they went upon four sides. And turned not as they went, but to the place whither they had just followed, in, followed it, and turned not where they went. And their whole body and their backs and their hands and their wings and the wheels were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that they four had. So now you're dealing with literal cherub and cherubims who um, are part and parcel of this ship. And creatures and, um, you know, eyes round about, full of eyes round about is like lights around the spinning wheel object. They look like eyes, but they're, you know, portholes or, you know, they're lights that are going on at the same time. We've seen, you know, examples of that. And you've seen some evidence of that from like UFO sightings and so forth, but not nothing like this. As for the wheels, it was cried unto them in my hearing, O wheel. So they would cry out. The wheels could receive commands and were also considered to be an extension of God's hand. O wheel. And everyone had four faces, and the first face was the face of a cherub, and the second face was the face of a man, and the third face the face of, of a lion, and the fourth face the face of an eagle, and the cherubims were lifted up. This is the living creature that I saw by the river of Chibar. And when the, remember, it was the wheels and this whole experience that put Ezekiel as the head prophet over Israel. That's how it all began with this. And here we are again in chapter 11, or chapter 10, dealing with this very, very same thing as part of the contiguous judgment of God in slaying the city because Ezekiel saw the abominations that were great. The Lord revealed himself and slew the city and then filled the temple of the Lord, the sanctuary, with the cloud of glory and sent the cherub and the cherubims and the man in linen to do his work to um, establish these lights, these power sources, these power from between the wheels and scatter it throughout the city so that they would all, um, the ones left in the city, would be witnesses to God's incredible movement. They would know why the people were slain. Is, I mean, that's, that's you know, becoming more and more clear. And when the cherubims went, the wheels went by them. And where the cherubims lifted up, their wings mounted up also from the earth, and the same wheels also turned not from beside them. 
When they stood, these stood, and when they were lifted up, these were lifted up themselves also, for the spirit of the living creature was in them. So um, you had the power source not making noise, but um, tremendously overwhelming, and it was able to lift this great, massive structure of cherub and cherubims and faces and eyes round about and wheels spitting within wheels and something like the Shekinah glory cloud as all part of it. And the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. So here we have the cherubims, which are part and parcel now of the actual ship, which has got wheels and cherub and cherubims. And the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. And when they went out, the wheels also were beside them. And everyone stood uh, at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house. And the glory of the Lord of Israel was over them above. This is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the prayer of, the, of Shebar. And I knew that they were the cherubims. Everyone that had four faces apiece and everyone four wings and the likeness in the hands of a man was under their wings and the likeness of their faces was the same face what was was the same faces which I saw by the river of Chebar their appearances in themselves they went everyone straight forward So the response of God was to cleanse the temple to slay uh, almost all of Jerusalem to then reestablish his control over the city, to put, uh, to fill the temple with his glory, and also to reveal that his glory and the wheels and all, everything was, um, you know, was the manner and form of the Lord, that the Lord has an, a, an appearance. You know, he has an entourage of cherub and cherubims. And they are part and parcel of these ships, which, in a sense, can um, come and go, meaning, you know, they can suddenly come into appearance and then be gone. You have the man in linen, another uh, angelic form uh, that looks like a man, obviously, doing the bidding. And then you have these creatures that are like four-faced creatures um, that are also part and parcel of the cherubim, which are then connected, and these cherubims... um, are very strange looking creatures, you know, and you know he likens their ability to fly as wings, but also says that they're they're next to they are all part and parcel of the ship, in other words, they all seem all to be actually the ship itself, the cherub and cherubims, and the cherub are operating the cherub meaning meaning um another angel uh these angels are operating you know the cherubims, which are um uh, wheels and wings and faces and throne of God and glory cloud. All of this goes together. You're going to have the cherub, the cherubims, the man in linen, God in in his in his form of a of a of a supernatural cloud of light, and um, this supernatural cloud of light and this force that powers these ships, and all that is something yet to be revealed to man. But this is something that is. Um, part and parcel with the cherub and cherubims. Without them, these things couldn't really operate. And yet they are still, in a way, they are part of the ship, meaning they're an integral part. I know it's hard to really kind of understand because we have an idea of a ship with an astronaut or a, a pilot that gets in and operates it. You know, So the cherub and cherubims are it. They, they kind of meld with, it all melds together as one big ship that can go here, there, uh, it goes straight forward wherever it goes. It doesn't f- make a... Um, the other thing it says, it doesn't make an arc or a circle. It goes like there and there and there. Everything's straight forward, straight ahead. So it goes straight here, straight there, straight here, straight there, straight here. It's, it's here, it's there, it's here, it's there. Always in a straight line, never in a circle. It never turns. It doesn't bank a turn and go you know, down the street. It's there or it's down the street or it's up the up the way, or it's in the temple, or it's hovering in the air. Now, this is the response of the Lord. You know, mass killing. I mean, this is Armageddon for Jerusalem. You know what I mean? Armageddon's almost superfluous now. This is Armageddon. 
I mean, this is it. Most of the city's slain. And, but that's not the point. The point is God. The point is, this is God's. And he will lay claim to it. And those who did nothing about the abominations or were, were enablers, and those who took part in them at the uh, sanctuary, <clears throat> which is, by the way, even today, most satanic ritual abuse and satanic ritual goes on in churches. Still the same today. So I prophesy thereby, therefore, with perfect clarity, that when you wonder what's happening with America, um, you have no idea. Even you, who expect the worst, are going to be shocked at how overwhelming the judgment is. God will not bless the United States of America. You know, I mean, like sort of. The, the, the head of it, the Washington, D.C., must be cleansed. And, um, you know, really it's down to now marking those people that are marked for mercy. And uh, I, I don't hold much hope out for these cities in the future. Like I said, a vision of Chicago burned out husk, you know, overrun by gangs. Uh, we've had Brother Thomas talking about flash mobs and standing up to them. You, you, know, you know, he predicted that, by the way, several years ago. And, you know... The flash mob thing was one of his uh, big predictions. So, you know, here we have the fulfillment of what um, what he said. And basically, you know, it, it the, the, the picture I think he paints and that I'm, you know, going to riff on here is a picture of basically Red Dawn. You know, Red Dawn where the commies attack and they come up from the, at that time it was, you know, the, South American troops coming over, but you're going to have, you know, you've got Russia, China, South America, you've got, you know, the people in charge now setting it up. And these people do abominations. I mean, they do all these rituals. They're the same. Why should they be any different? The Bible has shown us who they are and what they do. The elites of Jerusalem, of Washington, D.C., the beautiful people, the celebrated people in the media, they do these things thinking God doesn't see. Now, the response and, okay, being sealed by the Holy Spirit in the faith of Jesus Christ is the inkhorn, yes? Being washed by the blood of Jesus is the inkhorn, yes? Being written in the Lamb's Book of Life is the inkhorn of mercy, correct? It's the same parallel. If you're in the Lamb's Book of Life, then you're exempt from what you're going to see, but you will, like the people marked with ink, be a witness. Because you will see the glory of the Lord. You will have answered. Everything about UFOs you ever wanted to know will be answered. And you remember this. The word of the Lord, because I mean this was mentioned, so I'm going to go back to chapter 1. The word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Chibar, remember? He said this was the same vision, he, or not vision, but the same things he saw at Chibar, the cherubims, the cherub, the wheels, the ship. This, he, but here he is at Chibar. Now this is, I, I need to flash back here because this, I guess, is also integral as well. And I looked and beheld a whirlwind came out of the uh, north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself and a brightness was about it, cast out of the midst thereof as the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Beryl is like amber as well, okay? So this amber ship comes. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. Um, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings. So there's four faces and four wings. And their feet were straight. I, I, you know, I would almost take this as, as word. I'd say, you know, if they had four faces, they had four faces. However possible, hard to imagine, but, you know, possibly 
you know, people liken it to being one face on each quarter. So you'd have one face looking one way and one looking another. But anyway, and their feet were straight feet. And the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. And they uh, sparkled under the color of burnished brass. And they had their hands and a man under their wings on the four sides. Okay. So in other words, he's describing the cherubim here. And let me just go through it. And they had four faces and, and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another and turned not when they went and went everyone straight forward. And the likeness of their faces, they had four, the face of a man, the face of a lion, the right side, and, and the four had the face like an ox on the left side, and they had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces and their wings were stretched upward, two wings and every one was joined to another, and two covered their bodies. And they went, every one straight forward, whither the spirit would go. They went straight forward. Again, this is mentioned, they don't turn. They're here, they're boom, they're there, they're here, they're here, they're there, they're there. They go straight forward when they went, and they turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and the appearance of lamps. And it went up and down uh, among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning from the power source of this thing. So it's affecting weather. And the living creatures ran and returned. Well, not affecting weather, but it's creating weather is what I mean. And the living creatures that had returned to the appearance of uh, the flash of lightning. So the living creatures are all part of this power source and flash. They all, you know, sort of disappeared in this flash of lightning. Now beheld the living creatures. Behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. The appearance of the wheels... So the four faces are really becoming coming into view as just part of this craft, which is what we established. And but isn't it interesting how here we are again? Here, this is by the river Chibar. The appearance of the wheels and the work was like unto the color of barrel. Okay, there's barrel, and they had four, and they had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. So we have one wheel going one way, one going the other, that contains all these living creatures. And cherub and cherubim are part of the wheels, are part of the, um, the the power source, are all part of it, like almost like pieces of a machine. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful. So there's also rings. And when they went, they went upon their four sides and they did not turn when they went. They didn't turn. They went straight there, straight here, straight there, straight there. And no turning involved. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Whithersoever the spirit uh, was to go, they went. Thither was the spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. When those went, these went, and when those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them, and the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. So the thing is alive, and it's a ship, and it contains cherub, cherubim, living creatures. It, the actual structure of the ship, is like four different sides, like four different faces. The creatures are part and parcel of the ship. The, 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 the beings involved in the ship power the ship and the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color color of terrible crystal stretched forth and their heads above so really really bright awesome overpowering light of Shekinah and under the firmament were the wings straight one toward the other and everyone had two which covered on his side and everyone had two which covered on that side their bodies and when they went I heard the the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of the speech and the noise in a host when they stood, they let down their wings and there was the voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had uh, let down their wings and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of sapphire stone upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man above uh, upon it. 
and I saw the color of amber and the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his uh, loins even upward, up from the appearance of the loins even downward, and I saw that it was aware of the appearance of fire and had the brightness around about. I just have to tell you, I get chills here because I'm thinking this is Christ, you know, this is this is Jesus. And as the appearance of the of 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 the bow, uh, that is the cloud in the day of rain, was the appearance of the brightest roundabout. There was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. And he said to me, son of man, stand upon thy feet and I will speak unto thee. And the spirit entered into me when he spake to me and set me, you know, we hear about aliens and the, um, the, the, the taking over of minds and the, you know, the psychic link and, you know, the ability to appear as anyone you need to see and, you know, to, to be inside you talking to you and all that. Uh, so he, he, the spirit was inside of Ezekiel and he heard him speak. And he said, son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed, transgressed against me even unto this day. So he's appointed prophet. In other words, this whole thing had a point. The whole experience of the glory of the Lord. Him that sat on a throne. That, I mean, the light like a throne, but I mean, it's hard to make out because the light is so bright you can barely see through there. And, you, you know, the thing is shooting out lightning and wheels within wheels are turning. And, you know, it's an overpowering vision that Ezekiel sees. And this thing commands him. This throne of God, this, this glory cloud, this, these, the technology wheels, the cherubim cherubims and all that are accompanying it and the uh, power to fly here and there without turning, but just appear here, appear there, uh, comes out a voice of God really speaking to Ezekiel from uh, above the firmament of heaven, from ultimately from within him, inside him, like it should with anyone who has a prophetic gift. This thing is now, the spirit is in him, speaking to him from within and saying, Ezekiel, the, the house of Israel is rebellious, which we see in chapter eight. So this incredible vision appoints Ezekiel head of, of Israel. And then basically um, comes back again for the slaying of the old and young, men, women, and children, uh, to spare no one save for those who have the mark of the inkhorn, to spare no one. And then he says, this was just like the vision I had or the, like what I saw at the river of Chabar. So I went back to read to you what happened at the river of Chabar. He was appointed prophet over Israel. Because Israel said, what's the point of this? So that Ezekiel could warn that they're going to be slain. Not thrown into bondage, that they're going to be killed. So Ezekiel could explain and then God would show him what they do. So Ezekiel would know exactly what the charge was. And the whole point of it was the return of the Lord. Once they were gotten rid of, once the temple was cleansed, the Lord took charge of the city and put the power source from between the cherubim and between the wheels all over the city. It was now reclaimed as God's city. This entire story of Ezekiel is a story of Washington, D.C., in the sense that, um, and, you know, other power centers of the world, in the sense that they are equally as wicked, perhaps even more. How long do you think God will allow that situation to continue? The people of the obelisk to be worshiping their obelisks and their contacting their spirits and doing all the abominations they do which are now going more and more mainstream. I mean, it's not exactly secret. That's right. The point is that the abominations wax great. Yeah, people get killed, but that's not the point. The point is the revelation and the seeing, the glory of the Lord in the, in the form of technology we cannot possibly understand at this point because you're talking about creatures being part of a ship. 
You know what I mean? That, you know, they take their place on the ship as part of the ship and then it flies away. But this thing comes in. It's not deus ex machina. It's like there's this there's this appearance of God and there's a whole entourage that goes of cherub and cherubims and creatures and wheels and, and um, you know, this thing um, goes where it's going to go and can expand. It can actually expand to be the size of uh, the, the galaxy or it can be the size of a couple of football fields or it can be, you know, whatever it needs to be. There's no limit to, to God's expanse. There's no limit to God's expanse. There's no limit to the cloud of glory. It covered all of Jerusalem, not just that began in the temple, but then it can, it is a cloud of light that, that, that basically sanctified Jerusalem once again and scared the you know what out of the people who were left, who were, mur- who were spared, and those people would be set back to the righteous path. So the point of the UFO, you know, the point of it all, is it leads to the supernatural experience that answers all the questions about the UFO, the strange creatures, aliens, angels, cherub, cherubim, uh, man and linen, all of that is answered. You know, it almost reads like a fringe episode with those, you know, those guys with the bald head. But it's much more powerful than that. But I mean, I think people imagine that because they know somewhere in their mind, somewhere we all know that that this thing with the UFOs and the glory of the Lord and all this stuff we all know that everything is being judged, everything's being watched. Like we're like we're we're basically little guppies in a you know in some you know experiment that's not ours, you know. But we understand what the guy, the experimenter, is looking for. He's looking for a certain thing. If he doesn't find it, he cuts him off. So there's an instruction manual, the Bible, that says you know read this and take this to heart, and this will explain to you. You know, what you need to do to not wind up, you know, on, on the, in the killing floor. The elites doing the abominations of abominations that are extremely perverse and involve one another and children and, you know, men and, and women and killing and, and you know, the, the house of Israel is, as God said, filled with blood. So all the things these guys did was filled with blood. As you can imagine. Filled with blood. So what does that mean to you? What it means to me is there's about to be a reveal that the world may find disconcerting. I mean, I think that some of these movies and stuff about supernatural events in the sky being evil aliens from out there is some kind of a propaganda against the glory of the Lord. You know, to to make everything that comes from, in fact, including in many Christian circles, which, of course, I laugh at all those because most of those are, you know, hypocrites. You know, they worship the devil and then, then they have the, then they play at church and then they, they have their, you know, it's like everybody nowadays has a secret ritual room. Everybody nowadays is, is, you know, does these rituals thinking it's fine. Everybody nowadays indoctrinates kids, violating Matthew 18, 6, where the wrath of God's going to be on you. They don't think God sees. They indoctrinate, sell out their kids. They don't think that if you do that, it would be better that a millstone were around your neck and you're drowned at the bottom of the sea. And what happens to abuse victims? What happens to God's lambs on earth? They are hunted to be used, to be to be degraded, to be uh, uh, set up in games, to be demoralized to be put in mental hospitals, to be put in jails, whatever, to be sidelined, have false witness borne upon them. And God will recompense all of that, every single bad vibe even that was done in the name of Satan. Every single thing will be recompensed like for like, like for like. Everything that you've experienced being shunned, being hurt, all that. Justice of the Lord is 
like for like. Jesus said, who is the Lord, don't fear him who can kill you. Fear him who can kill you and send your soul to hell. That's what he said. Fear him who can kill you? No. Fear him who can kill you and send your soul to hell? Yes. Meaning fear God. I guarantee you, those not marked with the inkhorn, which is like a, a, a you know, a, we call likeness and shadow. God is always, you know, repeating. It's always repeating in various ways because he's the same, you know. He's going to deal with it the same way, you know. Jesus is the judgment. You know, you reject him, um, you're kicked out of the Lamb's Book of Life. If you want to be with the world, they want you to reject Christ within their secret societies and that's part of the initiation process, which guarantees you a trip to hell. Uh, you know, meaning, you know, all who enter here uh, give up all hope. You know, once you come through those doors of the, uh, the inner sanctuary, um, which has an exterior shield of being charitable and, you know, Jesus or whatever it is. But once you enter the inner sanctuary, you give up all hope, all those who enter. And meaning you give up, what's all hope? Christ. You must betray God to be in, meaning you have agreed that you don't think God really sees or that there, maybe there is no God. So you agree, well, heck, it's not going to, I mean, it's important to them that I reject uh, the Lord, but uh, it's no big deal. Nobody sees. It's not like it's done in open. I can still put my hand on a Bible and swear to the Bible and I can still go to church and I can still do all these things, even though I'm really not one i'm really one of you guys but then everybody at church is one of you guys too so so i'm here to tell you that god is going to get rid of all of you and it's going to be a supernatural experience that it's going to leave the cities in america and elsewhere burned out husks there will be nothing there'll be no barack obama he'll be begging you know, for a, for a piece of uh, rice on his knees, screaming and crying because he's been coddled by these evil ones all his life. When they're gone, when his system is gone, he'll just be babbling to himself on the corner. He won't have any power to go around and tell people what to do or do community organizing or whip, whip up the rabble against the rich people who have done all the, you know, he's rich. What an incredible hypocrite that guy is. Oh, well, don't get me started. I mean, but then again, so is every other person. I know. So, uh, the, but like I said, Ezekiel nailed it. <clears throat> These guys in Washington, D.C. are doing rituals behind closed doors. They're all part of secret societies and God sees them. And so the reason this is being uttered right now is to put them all on notice. Just don't think that electing a new president is going to help you. Don't think that any political solution will help you. The only thing that's going to help is those doors to the Lord's sanctuary where you're doing your abominations is shut. And if it isn't shut, then you're going to witness your nation being slain. The same, one, the same vision I had that everyone here is killed and replaced. Yeah. Everyone is killed and replaced in America. Men, women, children, And we are hurtling toward that day. And um, the powerful people of the earth won't believe it. But you're already starting to see precursors of it. You're already starting to see the, you know, flash mobs. And you're starting to see the chaos that could take out a city. You know, basically, just imagine most American cities as ghost towns. No, there won't be any communist rule. This is not a communist takeover. The communists can't control what's going on right now at all in any way, shape, or form. They're not going to control it. This thing is now out of control. And I'm here to give clarity to anyone who is, if you think you're elite, I've got a friend in LA. I, he thinks he's Somehow, he, he reads the Bible, he studies it, he says he loves the Lord, but somehow, um, he's still a part of the abominations. And he thinks somehow, God's going to forgive him. And he's just so deceived.
And I, I have a message for Washington, D.C. You either cease and desist on that. And, you know, and they're involved in, you know, buying and selling prostitutes, buying and selling drugs, buying and selling, um, you know, uh, children, uh, international slave trading, uh, gun running, you know, you know, uh, opium dealing. Afghanistan's all about opium. You know, it's all the same stuff. It's either slaves, opium, weapons, something like that. And, he, and they think God doesn't see. I think the biggest abomination they do is they worship death. You know, they worship the end of their existence. Uh, they obviously are suicidal, but they want to take everyone with them. You know, they don't want to submit to a holy God that if he really did appear and he will appear. Anyway, what's the point of all the abominations being filled with blood? In other words, all their blood rituals they do, they're seen by the Lord, you know, to take innocent people and kill them, traumatize them, to get the power off of them. God sees everyone, will repay everyone like for like. Every politician, every banker you complain about, every, um, uh, every, every corporate head, every um, little slave dealer, uh, you know, working the salt of the earth, and this is why Jesus said the rich will never make it into life because the kingdom is just life. So they will never live. They, in other words, they won't survive. You know, and what he means is the rich and powerful, you know, like the Pharisees of that day, which would be the equivalent of like the president and, you know, the, the Congress and, the, you know, people like that. Um, the people that are pure hearted about it, you know, the Ron Pauls of the world, they're they're vilified. They're, they're they stand out. They're not invited to any parties or anything. They're they're kept out because they're repressed Christians. But the libertine, you know, they they dine on the expense of you know the meek. They owe their existence and their television shows and talk shows and all that to the meek being killed. The blood that spilled is their boost of, of why they, they, you know, they, their power comes from that. Their power doesn't come from the Lord. It comes from all the abominations done in the name of abominations. Now here's a message. For those of you who are lambs who are dealing with like self-medicating and you know, things seem so screwed up. Again, you cry out to the Lord when you need help. Don't try to carry it all on your shoulders. You cry out to the Lord, the Lord will walk you out. You might have to change some things. But to those of you addicted to drugs and various things, this is Satan, what Satan's done. The reason that you're not a very good addict is because you're not one of them. In other words, they, they give you drugs in order to weaken you so they can then siphon off the life force off of you like vampires. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. So a lot of people become hosts and they're just used as battery packs. I've been used as a battery pack over and over. And I, I, I don't like it when I'm drained. And then I realize it was some witch that did it. I really resent that, you know, but the Lord says, I will repay that witch like for like. And it says, son, you just watch her or watch him. There's a lot of male witches. You watch him and you watch what happens to him in life. And I have, and I have seen. Not as dramatic as what happened in Jerusalem, but the same result. Sidelined ephemeral, disconnected, considered a loser, shunned. Anyone that tries to mark you or, lay a, uh, um, or touch one hair on your head is marked, tagged, and slated for extinction. What happens to them is the first thing they notice is, hey, I feel kind of disconnected. 
The second thing they notice is no matter what rituals they do, the juju, the mojo is gone. Doesn't work anymore. And then, you know, next thing is they're on the unemployment line. The next thing you know, they're Their families reject them. The next thing you know, you know, the same stuff that happens, they're repaid. Like every single thing that they've done, I've seen this, where everything they did to somebody else, boom, 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 it happens to them, one after another. How they hurt people's feelings, you know, how they they, they cause people to commit suicide and they, you know, abuse people in, in various ways. Every one of these things results in there um, is another strike. So they end up paying. They end up paying for everything that they've done. Every single thing that happens, they end up paying for. It is amazing when you see like for like happen to someone. You see them, you know, become infirm or lose an arm or go blind or not able to um, continue, you know, whatever it was they were doing, you know, to to, uh, lose their jobs, to lose their families, to have just, just things, you know, like there's a cloud over them. You know, a cloud that's just hurting them. And to see one thing after the other after the other happen to them. Uh, It's hard to watch. And I would say to them, repent. Anywhere along the way, repent. If this is happening to you, you've been disconnected. They don't, they, they, once they disconnect you, they never reconnect you again. You're done. You lost your place. That's it. Okay. There is no panacea with Satan. The only thing that people of Satan get is killed. Period. So that the glory of the Lord can return to the earth forever and ever. Eternal life. Life without end. Amen. You know, the UFO... Remember how they they, they would report, well, there have been UFOs over the Fukushima disaster or there have been UFOs here or there. There, There are these... You know, quite possibly angelic hosts, cherub and cherubims involved. Or that there are UFOs that prevented nukes from going off. Absolutely. That's what's going to happen when they fire, try to fire them all at Israel. They're all going to be supernaturally dis, uh, dismantled. Of course, that takes faith to see all that. A lot of people say, oh, yeah, I don't believe you, Z. The meek get hurt. And, you know, if you don't line up with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, the, the, the right power source and all that, you, uh, if you don't line up with Satan, you know, you don't, you know, aren't vetted in these secret societies, you aren't um, embraced by the world, you don't embrace the world, then you're just a loser and, um, you know, no one has your back. I have got news for you. Nobody has your back. You people have gone to the devil. Nobody has your back. I was in the parking lot at, at OB. Those of I mean, you know, Ocean Beach, it's a big dog park. So we spent the day. So he like was running around the beach. And, um, you know, it's a beach. You know, you can go there with your dog and be at the beach. So I was there. And I was in the parking lot. I'm really happy I was there. And OB is kind of like a hippified town, you know, very hippy dippy and very sort of shanty kind of you know and little shops and artsy in a way and you know kind of quaint and kind of kind of dirty and sort of um you know criminal drug kind of thing i think these guys were just stoned out of their minds i have no idea on what and they were skateboarding two girls and a guy you know young young you know i guess in their 20s or something anyway and the woman's going Oh, we're all just energy, man. We're just like, we're like energy, you know? It's just like, you know, we're we're energy. You know, can you groove on that? We're just energy. And it's like, I'm so happy that you're so tangible right now, talking to this guy who was on the skateboard. It's like, and I've been really waiting for that, for you to be more tangible. Now you're so tangible because, you know, we're just energy. There's no reason we shouldn't just all flow together, you know?
and they were looking at me and I was kind of looking at them and listening and I was being respectful. I wanted to hear everything. And I felt like Ezekiel seeing, you know, the abominations. I'm like, yeah, okay. Well, they're, they're obviously, you know, completely ripped on something. And I look like maybe ecstasy something, you know, maybe, I don't know, but something. A lot of people in OB are on drugs. You know, that's the, when I was young and I went there, I was on drugs. So, I mean, I've, so I wasn't in judgment of them, you know, as they were skateboarding and hugging and it's just tragic youth and I'm watching and uh, they're so indoctrinated by this false system. You know what I mean? It would take, I would felt like saying to the girl, you know what girl, whatever you're taking, you need like 10, you need to take 10 times more of it to break on through to the truth, not to the other side. You, you're on the other side. You need the truth. You know, maybe those drugs aren't strong enough. And I say that with tongue in cheek because, I mean, drugs are terrible. And I have I know there's some of you, like I say, struggling with drugs right now. And you, you've, if, if you're into meth, you have to close that door. Crack, close the door. Meth, worse than crack. Okay? You've got to close the door. Walk away. It would be better if you did Vicodin. It would be better if you did, you know, I'm just saying the meth, meth was developed by and for one purpose. Meth was developed to destroy humanity. It will destroy the uh, the first thing you'll notice after about a month of being strung out on meth, besides your teeth will fall out or get broken. The first thing you're going to notice is that you can see into other dimensions. There's bleed through there and all of a sudden you're being gang stalked everywhere you go everywhere you go it's you're getting a preview of hell what it will be like for them you don't want to be there meth is designed to take people to hell and the only people that do well in meth are people the devil owns that wouldn't ever come to god anyway and they sort of rule over hell you know and you're able to see people they appear they're sh shining lights in your house you'll see helicopters shining lights i'm not saying it's not happening I'm saying you're bleeding into another dimension where that stuff is happening. You try to explain it to someone and let's say, no, it's not happening. But I know you're seeing, you don't see hallucinations with meth. You see what's real. You see beyond a veil you're not supposed to see beyond. And it will literally destroy you. It's like if you came in contact with the Shekinah glory in a negative sense. But I mean, if you came into contact with the, 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 the Shekinah it could actually just burn you to a crisp where you'd be nothing. That's why Moses had to deal with the burning bush, okay? So, so, and, you know, the, the power of the Lord is, is, is absolutely, for, we're not, we're forbidden to see certain things because it will, you know, just like it will melt you in a, into oblivion. It's for your own good. Now the Starbucks is actually crowded. There's all kinds of surfers here and people that are getting ready to go to the ocean. And uh, it's amazing. You know, I am going to go ahead and... No, you need... Oh, across the street, there's a coffee bean. Well, shoot, I like that better. I didn't see that. Oh, well. I hate giving a witch figure money. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, these were like witch young witches that were and you know, they were they were working on this guy. They wanted him to be more his energy to be more tangible. I thought, dude, you better watch out. The what read between the lines. That means vampire. These people want to suck on your energy, baby. <laughs> and they they may, you know, suck on other things too, but that's just a prelude to the real whamification which is having your soul sucked out and becoming a zombie. And that's unfortunately what happens to people that say, we're all just energy, man. I mean, just groove on it. They're just, you know, this is a ruse. And you, I really was waiting for you to become more tangible. Yeah, so that vampire witch could suck you dry. I know, I got to be careful. I walk into a city and I can see them. They're all just waiting like vultures waiting to jump on somebody. Anybody they see that looks a little out of line, looks like they may not be conformed, you know what I mean? Anybody that looks like a little bit of a nonconformist, 
they're gonna they're just wait to pounce on you and you know so you don't need meth you need to have a plan to stop and never do it again and you need to move away from wherever you lived whatever people you were hanging around you need to get pack your car up and sell everything you've got and go with the Lord and go apply for a job in another city that's what you have to do you have to actually leave and cut all ties it's actually easier that way. But I'm telling you, anything less than that, you won't make it. The devil has got you by the balls. That drug will destroy and kill you. But first, it will degrade you. And second, it will scare you to death by putting you in contact with all the paranoid things of the bleed through to the other world and show you things there that you're not supposed to see, that God has one to protect you from, but that opens the door so that God can't protect you. Then you feel the Lord's abandoned you. He didn't abandon you. you. You went somewhere where you weren't supposed to go. You need to get out of there. So this is just a message for anybody that is on any kind of, especially those kind of drugs. This is the last thing a Lamb of God needs. Because, and let me explain this, the glory of the Lord, the cherub and the cherubim and the man in linen and the, the spinning wheels and the whole UFO thing is about to be revealed to you. I know that sounds really weird, hard to accept, but this is all part of it. The other part is justice, vengeance for all the people that have done, you know, basically Jerusalem built its power at that time on blood through abominations of blood. It didn't say Oh, they were just, you know, jerking off to images on the wall. No, it didn't say that. That's what people try to make it say, something like that. No, they killed. Full of blood means they killed everything and everyone that was opposed to them, different from them, lambs to the slaughter, whatever. They did that, and the Lord was repaying for that. So he said, don't even spare the children. If they're not marked with the inkhorn, then they're going down too. That means that children were taken. That means that, um, you know, yeah, satanic ritual abuse. That's, a, that's, yeah, that goes without saying that that was going on. You know, it's not going to be really graphic. A lot of it was edited, you know, to make it, you have to, you know, the Lord has to reveal what's going on there. I mean, if you just read it on a surface level, you know, the, the, the wheels of Ezekiel are intricately related to the death judgment. And the, the, the ones that wield the death judgment are angels and people who are appointed to, 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 to cleanse the temple. And it begins, obviously, at the house of the Lord. You know, and so you people in America who think that you can somehow have compromise you can't. Compromise will get you killed. You either cleanse the temple or it will be cleansed for you. And it will happen. And if it doesn't happen, I, my prediction, and I don't think it will happen. So I predict that uh, you can just kiss Washington, D.C. and the rest of it goodbye. I don't believe there will be repentance on any level for any reason. They don't think God sees they think they can do all their abominations and perversions and all the stuff they do and that nobody is watching. But the point of it getting to a head is because God's about to reveal himself. In other words, the return of Christ would be like, you know, God doesn't show you his form and the glory cloud and the, and the wheels and all that. He doesn't show people that because if he did, people would all get on their knees and they know God's watching. And he doesn't, he wants you to to have to figure out. In other words, he wants you to, whether God's watching or not, he wants you to do the right thing. You know? And people would just like, in the, in the presence of something that massive and supernatural, everyone would just fall on, the, on their faces worshiping and, you know, anybody would, would, would straighten up and fly right seeing that. Now, that's not revealed till after the cleansing. See, what they did before was filled Jerusalem with blood. And that's what the Bible says. It's filled with blood. What God 
you know, the house of Israel is full of blood is basically what it says, literally. But what God is saying is, um, you know, when he talks about blood, he's talking about cleansing the temple, reestablishing himself upon the earth, sparing those that are his. Anyone who is truly sealed by the Holy Ghost is spared, obviously. You're not going to go where these, you know, but the, the repaying like for like is something that I've seen done. That takes time, but that's the kind of judgment that I've seen, supernatural judgment, where it just logic defies logic that anybody would uh, pick on these people in that way, that they would, um, you know, basically uh, you know, um, have one thing after another happen to them. Doesn't matter how powerful they are. They, you know, they go out, they get their shot and they go out, you know, whether it's a back problem and they can't be on the radio anymore, you know, just one thing after another, after another, after another, they lose significant others. They, they lose their way. They get old, they get feeble. They forget, you know, they don't know where they're going. And, um, it's the saddest thing in the world to watch and you don't want to really be part of that. The people of God are always going to be conscious, you know, pretty much. And um, the Lord sort of leads us like nomads in the desert. We're, we're led. Last night, you know, I'm in this parking lot where there's like a motorhome next to me, another trailer, and then I'm there. And I just was talking to, you know, talking, and I just decided to let it rip about God's way. And I, I heard some grumbling in the thing next to, like, probably they were objecting to my prattling on and preaching. And, but I just was being very loud, very loud. You know, you either do it this way or perish. You either do it right or perish. You either go along with God's laws or perish, you know, basically is what I was saying. And, um, of course, that got me a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of friends there on the bluff. But the reason I felt the need to do that is because, first of all, it doesn't do me any good to soft pedal this stuff because lives are at stake and people are perishing and, I, and I, I, we don't want to see that. So we want to see as much repentance as possible. And if they want to take a shot at me for being um, uh, you know, too loud, um wearing it on my sleeve. Well, of course, that's where I'm going to wear it. You know, I'm here to warn that if they keep going the way that, well, I'm here to warn just a day-to-day -day life. Uh, how many people that I saw who picked on, you know, lambs, and it's awful what they do. I, it's horrible watching, you know. The, some of these witches will get a lamb, and they it's like being on a conveyor belt. The next thing you know, the guy can't even talk. He's like had everything stolen from within him. They, it's all, almost like putting him in a meat market. You know, where they, you know, they chop off the arms and the legs and the, you know, each one takes a piece. Each witch takes a piece. And I, I asked a friend, well, why do they do that to people? You know, like a month later after they're done with them, it's like they, they can't even talk, mention their own name. They're, they, they end up being thrown into institutions. Uh, they just, uh, people just don't explain. They look the other way because it scares them. So I just cut to the chase and say, and say, look, I see what's going on. Why? Do they do that if that's so evil to ruin someone's life who didn't mean them any harm? And they probably thought they were just friends. They didn't realize they were witches who were just hungry predators looking for a meal. And my friend just said, because they can. That gave me a whole new view of woman, of women. I think from that day when I understood that, I, I really... You know, any woman who would want to become my friend for some weird friend, I, I you know, a, a huge red flag goes up, you know, kind of like, um, why? There's no chance of marriage. I'm not going to cheat on my wife. Um, you know, th th there's uh, no sexual tension possible. <laughs> There's no um, conversation that I really want to have other than with the, my own family when I, that I have. So what's the point? I'm not looking for women friends to hang out with. So what's the, I don't want, I'm not the person who hangs out with anyone. I don't, I'm, I don't roll that way. 
You know, I see people on the way and it's really nice and then and, and I leave and then, you know, and see other, I don't have any junta, any sort of gang that I hang out with that, that is absolutely anathema to my calling of the Lord. That is not what he wants. You know, then you start listening to them and not him. That's, that's suicide. So that's not going to happen. So what's the point? Okay. Well, the only point is manipulation and some sort of, uh, uh, Well, like I say, it's it's manipulation on a kind of a, you know, what you might call a grand scale. Um, it's manipulation a lot of times to get control of you so that they can then take what you have in you out of you and have it for themselves, which, of course, would do them no good. And knowing they did some sort of psychic surgery where they sort of took your consciousness out and you know, divvied it up or took your soul out and feasted on it. And that's basically what you're dealing with. You know, that, that's, that's the kind of thing you're dealing with. And, um, I find that to be very cruel. And I pledge that I would defend people from that sort of thing. But if your life is like, um, if you feel that, I mean, no, there's sometimes they can just, um, drain me and there's really nothing I can do about it. You know, there's really nothing that I can do about, uh, those occasional times where something hits me. I, I can pray. I can pray to be revived. I mean, they can't do much more than that. They can't, you know, take what God's given me. (laughs) They can't take you know, the only thing way to prevent it probably is to just really, really be totally 100% just um, aggressively with God. And, you know, and then you have to also stand against uh, the, the abominations of the churches and, the, you know, the hypocrites and all this everywhere. And then, you know, it's it's uh, very much a lonely walk. But I mean, some people, that's what they have. You know, my job is to wake people up. And especially people that are kind of mid-level that aren't really going to get anywhere with Satan anyway. And to get them, you know, woken up to the fact that they've they've already been betrayed. They've already been, you know, signed, sealed, delivered, and sold out. And they need to not be there because the devil doesn't care about these people. You break on through the other side, that's, you know, you're a sucker, You know, yeah, you get to be, some people get to be famous, but I mean, you know, in the end, you're a sucker. You know, you give up life for five minutes of fame. I mean, you're, you're, it's idiotic. God doesn't see, God sees everything. It's all playing on this, you know, tape recorder over and over again. There's no way to get away from it. It's like, there it is. See, that's why there's a need for repentance. But this is, um, you know, the way it works. God's hidden people say, oh, God doesn't see. He's forsaken this place. He's gone. He's distant somewhere. Then the people are marked for judgment, destroyed, civilization destroyed, whatever. And then comes the glory of the Lord for the witnesses who were spared to reestablish. Okay. This is a complete picture of the return of Christ. He comes, the Son of Man comes when you least expect that he's going to come, when you least expect it. Uh, meaning that there will not be a sign given to anyone over any of this stuff. No sign will be given. When you least expect it, that's when it's going to happen. So, and the revelation of the Lord does not come, does not come until... uh, the end of judgment because and I I think this is the reason because this is a test he's not going to reveal himself and then have everyone act like good suddenly he wants to know the true nature of a person and deal with each person individually and that's what it is we don't deal collectively with people those called with prophetic gifts do not hang out in churches prophetic gifts hang out um, th- th- they they are, you know, alone. They, they, they may have families and this and that, but, you know, they are there to confront the populace, to, to expose the evil, as Ezekiel did, 
to be shown and usually are have to end up being witnesses to the downfall of that civilization. I mean, that's, you know, the prophetic gift and calling. It's not to start playing footsie with people. Even the people I'm closest to, each of us pursues, you know, uh, look, I can commune with my friends and, you know, we can, we're, we're there in the same tent and completely copacetic, like old family, like brothers and sisters should be. There's no air about it. it. You get along, but then you go your way and there's no explanation. You know what I mean? There isn't this sort of, well, then we'll meet next Thursday at the bar and hey, you're going to go to crab night? Yeah. And then, uh, wow, did you hear that concert? Wow, let's go to the, now there is none of that because we are here as a nomadic people. You know, you may be hunkered down in your house and job and all that, but you're still nomadic. What I mean by that is you're not going to be part of any group. You're going to be dealing with this person, that person. You, you go where you're led. You go where you're sent. The Lord would never pick a prophet to be in a church. Just If a prophet appeared in a church, they would be kicked out of that church or they wouldn't be any good at it. The minute you start prophesying in church, they want you to shut up. And with that, I must go. The end of the transmission today. The um, Lord is going to reveal to some of you this UFO thing. But just be cautious because, you know, not everything that glitters is gold, but not everything that is like a supernatural ship uh, that you may experience is necessarily demonic either. Because the cherubim, you know, they become the ships. You know what I'm saying? If they, they're part and parcel of the ship. The cherubim, the wings, become like part and parcel to these uh, uh, these ships. It, it was almost very hard for Ezekiel to explain it. But he, I think, you know, he was very consistent when you see the Chabar River part of it in chapter 1. Then you're in chapter 8, and he says, this is just like that vision or that vision, this, it wasn't a vision, it was reality. This was just like then, and it had perfect consistency, as you saw. The first time was to appoint him over Israel, and the second time was the slaughter of those involved in the abomination and their children. And it was all about revealing the glory cloud of God in the temple and the power of the cherub and the cherubim between the uh, wheels and the cherubim that that power be distributed throughout Israel. Now, Jerusalem has gone the way, I mean, I wouldn't say blood, but I mean, I definitely think Jerusalem, you know, there's an obelisk at the Knesset. You know, that's very disturbing. But I don't think, and, you know, yeah, most most of the elites in uh in Israel are members of secret society. So, you know, here we have a, kind of a, like a mini United States. So my same warning goes for Jerusalem. You know, um, you cleanse the temple on your own or it will be cleansed for you. But Jerusalem is not as much on the chopping block as the United States of America. Meaning, you know, all they would have to happen is to get us into some sort of nuclear war, which would be an inside job too, by the way, because, you know, the nukes would have to be set up to explode. They can't really just drop them and shoot them. You know what I mean? They'd have to actually, you know, go in it like, and there's still no guarantee they'll go off, but I mean, it would have to be allowed by God who would use, who would use these, you know, dark forces to then wreak vengeance upon those who have hurt his children. I mean, that's basically what, what, um, you know, take a mama grizzly. I mean, would she, right? I mean, take anything in life. There, you can't have, when it becomes, okay, here's the thing. When it becomes full of blood, that is innocent blood. That's what, what full of blood means in, in uh, Ezekiel. It means innocent blood. Then God will, will bring his judgment. And then he will appear to the faithful but not before then. 
There'll be no sign given to this generation. Your church is a cry out for prophecy. And people, the prophets in the churches have to make it up. Have to give them what they want. Have to satisfy them. But no prophecy was given. They speak out of their own minds. And when you get to Ezekiel 13, it's a message to all the false prophets. And then to the witches and the divining uh, witches who are prophesying and manipulating by hunting souls that should... um, uh, uh, that should live and to making them die, i.e. full of blood. Here we go again. It's another repeat. I've taught on that before. It's very, very clear what the existence is and what, the, um, and what happens here and why it happens. So man will never be able to sustain himself, govern himself, or even exist without killing every last man unless God intervene. So he has not gone away. He's sitting right there in your secret societies, behind closed doors, and every abomination and perversion that you do is being videotaped from every angle possible to be shown on a massive IMAX display over and over in your head so that uh, he doesn't really have to judge you into hell. You're just going to volunteer for it. Oh, that'll be after you begged for death for over and over and screamed and yelled, you know, you just would rather die. No, there is, you can kill yourself, but you're not going to die. You're going to go through this. You're going to, you're going to have to stand there and have this repeat of what you did for the entire world to see. Everyone will see it. And then I suppose you'll try to beg for your life or for another chance. That's what the rich man did. He begged Lazarus, please tell them. But there was no way to get back to the terrestrial earth. It was too late. In Jesus' name, I bless you completely, each and every one of you. To those of you who are, no, I'm saying the truth, um, you know, you need to, you know, that, that you've been wondering about this for a long time. There is no compromise with God, okay? That's why the churches don't, are not effective. And also they're going to be held accountable for what they've done to the children there. Whatever church. I've, I don't know a church where there isn't uh, some sort of child abuse going on. So um, basically the, the whole church will be blamed for the one child. Okay, it's the way God works. It's just, I'm sorry, but the vengeance uh, up for children is massive. Massive. It's generational. It will go to your next of kin, your next generation, the next generation after that. It's massive. It's, it's, it's the most egregious sin that you could possibly commit would be not only to abuse a child, and I mean, you know, mentally, sexually, spiritually, whatever, that, that's bad enough, and that, that brings Matthew 18.6. But turning a child from the Lord who otherwise would be with the Lord, you know, selling out your child, that is the millstone around the neck judgment. Um, What millstone around your neck means is basically your children are marked for death. Your seed will be cut off. If there are generations, they will suffer as paupers and slaves to the very people that you sucked up to, that you or you felt you are in power over, they will become their slaves. It means that if there is any life in your seed after you're gone, you will be from wherever you are cognizant. You'll, well, you'll, you know, in a sense, be in them, right? So you will be completely conscious uh, a thousand percent of every unlucky, horrible thing that happens. You do not mess with a holy God. The God of this earth, the God of the, the created heaven and earth, God, Jesus, God, Yeshua, God, Yahweh, God, the one. You do not mess with this Shekinah glory cloud, this supernatural event that, that can't even be described. It's so beyond um, human comprehension. You touch one of his creation, one of his children, and you have, you know, would you go up to a mama grizzly bear 
and take one of the cubs and, and mess with her, even get close to it. No, because it would be a suicide. Well, that's in, in effect what these secret societies have done. They have already committed suicide. And they laugh about, oh, well, we're, we're part of the dead. We're cool. That's funny until you get uh, your, your uh, you know, prostate removed and your gallbladder removed and your lungs removed and whatever else, your kidneys and, you know, Alzheimer's and throw you into the thing. And then, you know, uh, if you're lucky enough to die, then you wake up with a big video screen and, um, you know, the, you know, what did you do? on your summer vacation while you came to Earth. Well, wow. wrong choice. Oh, wait, let's look at this tape. Is this what you did? And is this what you did? And is this what you did? Okay. And you claim to be a son or daughter of the Most High God, and here you are rejecting God and harming children and harming other people and... and uh, boosting yourself from harming, uh, doing harm and selfishness and idolatry and perverseness and all the things that um, you, know, you talk about in your churches that you're against it, you're doing it. And here it is, and here's the proof. So what do you have to say for yourself now? Don't fear the one that can kill you. Fear the one who can kill you and throw your soul into hell. That's the one to fear. Well... I can't preach anymore. I've, 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 I just wish I could grab you and drag you kicking and screaming to the altar, but you see, it doesn't work that way. See you next time. <laughs>